Good evening and welcome to Sports Federation TV. My name is Alton Davids. I'll be your host. The show we talk about a range of different codes of sport brought to you by the Western Cape Provincial Sport Confederation. Our first segment is something that intrigues me and something that I'm very passionate about. We talk about the history of sport in a general space. But more particularly tonight we'll talk about the history and how sport has changed over time in badminton. Dr. Charles Jumpies, good evening. Are you well, sir? Yes, thank you very much, Alton. Thank you for taking time out of your of your busy schedule. As as the vice president and life member of, of Western Province Badminton, tonight I want to unpack a little bit about some of the, the history. Badminton in, in Cape Town is n celebrated 95 years of existence this year. So, so I want to be just retrace some of the steps of how badminton has grown way back as far as you can recall and the history records that you have to where we currently are now and how sport has changed, particularly your code of sport, since unification, unification in your case started before the general unification for want of a better understanding. Yeah. Um, and, and, and let's just have that conversation as to where we find ourselves now. Um, but let's, let's take a step back. Give us a bit of history about who you are and how you, you got into badminton. Well, I originally lived in what is known as the council houses. And just opposite my house, there was this municipal hall. And um, the, the person in charge of the hall, he, it was also his responsibility to coach anybody that comes to the hall, mm. the various codes of sport. And badminton was one of them. So, so this guy who was, was a municipal worker was a, a, a sports coach, effectively, multi-sport multi, multi -sport coach. Dominoes, ba uh, badminton, table tennis, sure. boxing, um, netball. Mm. He was responsible for as many codes of sports that could fit into the hall. Wow. And then, of course, I uh, saw people playing badminton. Mm. And uh, then I became interested as a married person. How long ago was that, Mr. Jumpies? That was more than 50 years ago. Sure. Sure. S s yeah. So, um, and because I liked the speed of the game, I became interested and I started reading up in it. There was the chairman of the non-white association, Mr. John Adams, who lived in Cork Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a librarian. How long ago are we going back now? That's the 50 years I'm talking so about. So that's 1950, 1940 or 45, 50, that kind of era. 19, about 1950, yes. Okay. Now, he was, he was the librarian at the, the Steenberg uh, the Steenberg Library. And of course, uh, being a teacher then, I allowed myself to be guided by what was written in the book. Mm. So I went to the library to go and see whether I could find a book on badminton and badminton coaching. Mm. And, th and that is where John Adams, who was then the chairman of the non-white badminton association, took interest in this young man interested in badminton and then of course he gave me the further guidance and that is where I started and I, I started coaching badminton to the people in Kevda. Now I'm not sure whether you know Kevda uh, but Kevda would, doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Uh, they had a, a hall which used to be a cow shed sure. and uh, they we changed the hall into a hall where, of course, badminton could be played. Now, it, it was a cow shed, which means the, 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 the height of the roof didn't apply to badminton. But we had to play and allow the shuttle to, to go through the beams. Yes. Because the moment it touched the beam, it would have been a fall. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you don't hear stories like this of, of, of how you have to adapt to make it 
a success. I mean, you're playing in a, in a, in a cow shed of all things in the 50s. Tell us some more. And because the, the young people I coached, the only game they, that they played was the Kerem in Dominos. Mm. And yeah, this young teacher came in and introduced a totally new game. And I was compelled to coach them in such a way that they could play the shuttle very accurately. To be able to go through the beams. To go through <laughs> the beams. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, which made them become very, very good players. Mm. So the jump is, so, so fast track us through, uh, I mean, that is 1950, 1960. How has uh, how is, how is badminton changed between 1970 to, 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 to 1980, 1990, when unification started? I mean, uh, and, and that was a real tense moment because at that point in, in, in the country's history, we were still very much segregated. Yep. Yet badminton decided to take the leap of faith and start that amalgamation process. Take us through some of those challenges and some of the, the, the rationale behind it. Yeah. Badminton, the associations didn't, didn't start as such. The, what happened that in the non-white community, as we would have experienced in the white community as well, they were the top players. Mm. So much so that there was nobody that could beat them. And they, they were looking for opponents that they could really p have a good game against. Um, and that is where we had the, the good ones in the white section and the good ones in the non-white section. Mm. And because they decided that they wanted more than just playing local competitive badminton, those players decided they want to play against each other. But of course, um, when SACOS was in existence then, and very powerful, uh, they, the slogan was that no normal sport in an abnormal society, which means that we weren't allowed to play non-white against whites. Mm. Interesting conversations we are having with uh, Dr. Charles Jumpis. Um, Badminton, we'll take an ad break and we will come back. We'll continue our conversation with this fine young man here. Let's take a break. See you now.